Good evening, ghoulies, and welcome to Dr. Destruction's Crimson Theater. What a treat you're in for tonight because we got, uh, what are you dreaming over there, buddy? He's already falling asleep and we even got to the movie yet. I'm sorry. Anyway, we've got the one and only Professor Dennis Bayusik from University of Wisconsin Parkside, and he's got a big opening coming up on the 20th of July at the Anderson Art Center at uh, 1.30, you say, huh? 1.30. And, uh, okay, what's the main there? there? Yes, you've got to be there. The doc can't make it. I'm sorry. You know, I got other arrangements, unfortunately. But I'll come in and slip in there and check Andy it out. Andy Warhol had substitutes. Don't you have a substitute? You've got it. There you go. I think I'll have to find a Dr. Destruction substitute somewhere, even though I'm sure we couldn't pay any fool enough money to pull that one off. Anyway, would you like to talk uh, seriously now? Would you like to talk about uh, your works at the uh, gallery? And, uh, you know, you can flash on the painting a few times there, Ralph. Sure. Uh, well, this is an example of the series that I've been working on that's there. Uh, still wipes, but kind of surreal, and uh, they uh, involve a lot of symbolism that sort of is recurrent and that is fantasy related. Um, but uh, this is one that's going to be shown elsewhere in Chicago, in, or in, uh, in Wisconsin actually, that's not in the show. But many of them have my self-portrait in a whole range of kind of symbols, uh, not unlike a dream, even though this didn't come from a specific dream. Uh, but they're dream-inspired paintings. Dream-inspired. Right. Oh, boy, I'll tell you, I, what about nightmare-inspired paintings? <laughs> nightmare. I could tell you forever about that. I enjoy nightmares as much as any good dream because it's vivid. It's strong, it's imagistic, and that's what artists look for. They need images, they need uh, icons, visual icons to play with. And uh, so, yeah, I hope you come to the, sh to the opening and see the artwork. Yeah. Oh, yes, Ghoulies, you have to definitely go check that out. I mean, he's a very, very poignant, strong artist, uh, probably the best artist known to me, and I mean that for real. And uh, uh, I noticed Thank you, you do put your self-portraits in, in your work a lot. Well, it's, it's a tradition, you know, Rembrandt m must have painted at least 75 self-portraits. So it's kind of a traditional exercise that I make my students do, so I do it. And uh, they're all different mirrors and positions, even though I kind of work in the same spot in the studio all the time. Uh, but I always get myself in there somehow. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, and you can even see me age in the grouping of the paintings uh, because there's a range of work there from the you know, last 10 years now. You know, it's not all real recent. I see. Um, also, I, I noticed that, you know, by looking at your works, they're almost instructional when you look at them. You almost learn just by looking at the brush strokes and the techniques and the various glazes and things that you've done. And you really don't label your work, though, or do you? Well, they're titled. They're not labeled. I'm not sure you mean on the front. Oh, stylistically. Or... Well, I think they're they're in the spirit of probably uh, fantasy. Even though these are eyeball paintings, I set this all up in the studio. But the way I arrange it is sort of controlled by intuition and by the subconscious as much as the conscious as I work it up. So it's not unlike uh, going into an attic and picking out things to, you know, some free association and arranging them to get uh, some kind of symbolic connections worked up. Like this, and I always have a book in there. Uh, this book is called The Clown. And uh, then there's usually some other wording. If you look hard, there's little, like this says job. So this painting is called Clown Job. And, and in a way, I kind of look a little clownish here related to some dreams. There's masks in my dreams and they're clown-like. So this maybe is related to a little clown down here. You can see that. Yeah, it's too bad we, did, we couldn't really get into some of these closer because uh, you have to go check it out at the Anderson because the work is phenomenal. And it's the only way I can describe it. Um, there's I, always been something above average or far beyond above average with your work. Uh, just the way it speaks, the way it grabs you, pops out, and... Um, I like how you said it's instructional because uh, I've never heard it described that way before, but that's interesting. I like that from a pedagogic point of view, uh, it's like I do try to show off different 
uh, treatments, and like this one has a lot of texture in it. If you, if you can, I don't know if they can see that, but it's very built up with the brushwork. And then yet there's glazing, and there's thin paint and thick paint. So there's a whole range of uh, information here visually going on, and I, I like that adjective instructional. Yeah, that kind of hit me today when I was at the Anderson early. Oh, I, I let the cat out of the bag. I've already seen the exhibit, ghoulies. Uh, the doctor had to do some uh, remote film work on his own due to the fact that the crew is very small and underpaid and hardly ever show up, and usually they're drunk when they get here. But anyway, uh, we've got some footage of the, uh, the show at the gallery that we can show now, and I believe we started out uh, with those acrylic paintings on the east wall. Um, we're uh, not going to be able to see it on the monitor. Oh. <laughs> no, <laughs> we're, uh, we're not that high tech here. <laughs> but if you want to talk a little bit, uh, you know. Well, there's a range of both oil and acrylic there. And there's some airbrush work. This is not an airbrush painting at all. It's uh, all done with the hairbrush, not the airbrush. And, uh, but I, I use both. In fact, there's, there's, there's other techniques there too. I also have some little books. I do a lot of book binding where I involve painted books. In fact, the show is called uh, Painted Books and Bookish Paintings because in all the paintings there's some reference to a literary book. This is actually a pretty famous novel, The Clown, but it set up the stage for this whole ensemble of uh, symbols here. There's a little purple teddy bear which is somebody gave me long ago and I kind of sleep with it once in a while. And it's in the painting here. So, and there's this crazy hat that somebody gave me, and it has a spiral on it, so that spiral has, has become kind of a symbol that I use a lot. And if you, so it's, it's really filled up uh, with symbols. I don't like paintings that are empty. I like, to me, more is more, rather than less is more. Right. So, I guess I like that visual density of information, not unlike a medieval book, you know, mm -hmm. that's, uh, the Book of Hours where they had the illuminations that filled every square inch. And they had a word for it. They, they, it was almost like a disease. They call it uh, uh, horror vacui, horror of a vacuum. They didn't want any empty space. They wanted to fill up everything. It was like a control method of controlling your, your uh, field of vision. And I guess that's what they were trying to do. So I, I tend to do that. I'm not sure. I haven't been able to like be minimal. It, in fact, it's like maximal. It's like more is more. So. Yes, I appreciate that. That's the, one of the things I like, and uh, you know, it's uh, hard to, hard not to uh, appreciate it for uh, you know. Well, it's like your what's painting. What's going on here? It's like. Uh, uh oh, it's a little advice uh, about that one. Uh, oh, well, we can do that later on. All maybe. right. But, but you but, you like an artist? You were inspired by an artist who liked a lot of visual stuff happening too. Yes, uh, Ivan Lorraine Albright. Yes, yeah. Ivan Albright. Yeah, yeah, we showed the picture of Dorian Gray, as a matter of fact, a couple of weeks ago, Ghoulies, I think that was on, just before the Godzilla movie. We had the picture of Dorian Gray. I rate that as my all-time favorite horror film. And, uh, of course, the painting's a big factor in that. And you can see that at the uh, Chicago Art Institute. Yes. My Ghoulies have heard this night and day. You can trust me. I've Go been, there uh, and see uh, the other Albrights, too. They're, they're oh, so. yes, and uh, several of the other artists there. Um, can you name maybe some of your favorites, or do you take them all as uh, well? Well, uh, of course, I come out of surrealism and symbolism. Uh, those are two movements historically, and I guess um, you know Dali is inevitably a, a favorite. I like his technique. He gets excessive once in a while, but he is uh, he is a great painter, really. Uh, his famous painting of the uh, melting clocks, the persistence of memory it's called. Maybe we'll see it later and in, uh, in, maybe not, I don't know. Uh, but it, I saw it. <laughs> you never know on Crimson Theater, <laughs> uh, you know. I, For sure. uh, I always thought it was a huge painting and then I went to New York City and it's in the Museum of uh, Modern Art and they have a whole wall devoted to it. But it's, it's only this big, it's like 9 by 12 inches and yet it, the space is so overwhelming. Uh, in the symbolism of it. So he's, he's an excellent artist. And of course I like, there's other surrealists like Magritte um, and Max Ernst and, and de Chirico and so forth. But uh, I think everybody would know who Dali was.
Oh, I'm sure they know, <laughs> big time. Anyway, you know, we got to get into tonight's feature. We dug up a great one. It's called uh, Bucket of Blood. I don't know if you've ever seen it. Um, Bucket of Blood? Bucket of Blood. I, do we have to watch that one? I actually did bring a Dali film that I'd love to show, that I would rather show. It's a crazy Dali, the first surrealist film. It has to be a little bit historically more exciting than the Bucket of Blood. So I, I want to show that. It's called the uh, Le Chien Andalou in French, the Andalusian dog. And you're going to see it here tonight on Dennis Bay Music's Dioxin Purple Theater. Now you get to the movie, ghoulies.
Louis Bunuel was already in Paris. He'd come into contact with the Surrealist group and had embarked on his career as a filmmaker. It was at about this period that Louis Bunuel one day outlined to me an idea he had for a motion picture that he wanted to make, for which his mother was going to lend him the money. His idea for a film struck me as extremely mediocre. It was avant-garde in an incredibly naive sort of way, and I told him that this film story of his did not have the slightest interest, but that I, on the other hand, had just written a very short scenario which had the touch of genius, and which went completely counter to the contemporary cinema. How was the experience of the dog Andalus and the age of gold with Buñuel? The dog Andalus was very fast because he wanted to do something like Gómez de la Serna, a periódico, que se ve todo lo que pasa en el periódico y después al final tanta información hay alguien que con una escoba se lo va a en fin, una cosa que me pareció terriblemente vulgar. Entonces, como que tenía 60.000 francos, dije, ven enseguida yo te, te hago un guión. Y me acababan de llevar una caja de zapatos y encima de la caja de zapatos escribí el perro andaluz, que después lo hicimos juntos, con una colaboración absolutamente fraterna. O sea, nos divertimos muchísimo con él. Una panza de fresia andaluz, a cosa de ref que nos hago muy... Liquel. En ref de... Luis Rebe que le había la memplen de Fourmi, me raconté el ref. Y me hace Rebe en Kutoki y Kupen él. Ahora le dio un puro refer en film a ver le mec des éléments comme ça, irrationnel, et nous avons écrit les scénarios en sept jours. Sept jours Sept, sept jours. Ouais. Quelle était la règle d'écriture La règle était refuser toute image qui pouvait avoir une explication rationnelle, ou des souvenirs, ou dire à la culture. C'est-à-dire toute image qui nous apparaissait, et nous la trouvions impressionnante, qui nous impressionnait, on l'acceptait sans discuter. Vous aviez un droit de veto l'un sur l'autre ouais. On ne l'a pas employé, non. Mm. Les vétos consistent à dire, je n'aime pas ça. Et l'autre dit, c'est un effet, il n'est pas bien. Mm. Dali went to Paris to shoot the film with Bunuel. He made a brief appearance in his favourite scene, dressed up as a Jesuit priest. The shooting of the scene of the rotten donkeys and the pianos was a rather fine sight, I must say. I made up the putrefaction of the donkeys with great pots of sticky glue, which I poured over them. I also emptied their eye sockets and made them larger by hacking them out with scissors. In the same way, I furiously cut their mouths open to make the white rows of their teeth show to better advantage, so that it would appear that although the donkeys were already rotting, they were still vomiting up a little more of their own death, above those other rows of teeth formed by the keys of the black pianos. The whole effect was as lugubrious as 50 coffins piled up into a single room. Chien Andalou is an animated Dali painting, an admirable sadistic realization appealing to everyone's latent masochism. A Chien Andalou, that succès de scandale, marked my first Parisian recognition. Who make, made art history? Not the most reasonable people, the madman did. Yes, that's very true. So if, if uh, painting is the, <coughs> the mirror of a uh, time, it must be mad to have the true image of what the time is. Yeah, that uh, sounds a very dangerous uh, well, parallel. Dangerous. Everything is Doesn't dangerous. Uh, because if uh, art is to be uh, uh, mad as the politicians are mad... No, 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 we are mad in a very different way. Yes, oh. I suppose exactly that, that is the great opposite. difference, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. To one madness be opposed another madness. Yes. So the, the, the irrational in yes. uh, art is an absolutely essential ingredient, do you think? It this is essential. Yes. Having exposed himself to a flood of new influences and ideas, Dali decided to return to Spain and immersed himself in painting. 
From the moment of my arrival at Cadaqués, I was assailed by images of my childhood. Wow, that was completely fantastic. My ghoulies were in for a real treat. Some of them may be a bit confused because uh, not too many other horror hosts tried to uh, raise the level of artistic understanding like the doc. But, you know, I mean, there's too many petty things going on in, in this town as it is, and we've got to try to, you know, stir some interest and some education out there somehow. But uh, why don't you tell me a little bit more about this film? Well, it was the first surrealist film, and if you watched it closely, there were, like looking at my paintings, there are connections, associations that you can begin to make uh, in the film. Uh, if I was watching it right now again, I could point those out, but uh, certainly there's recurring little motifs like the bike rider's outfit that uh, represents, you know, part of his psyche and that gets taken off and thrown away and uh, and he goes through some changes and if you watched carefully he actually at one point uh, murders one side of himself there uh, when uh, the hands uh, turn into guns in a sense and he kills a side of himself that uh, uh, he can't deal with. So it's very psychological. I don't think I can give a definitive symbolic analysis because it's, it's very open-ended too and Dali really have left it open-ended. And if you, I did attach onto the film, if you had time to watch it, uh, Dali and Bunuel who both made it. Uh, they were both surrealists in the 20s. And that was 1928, by the way. It was pretty racy for 1928 and pretty uh, uh, overwhelming and shocking, you know, to the art community at that time because there wasn't anything quite like this dreamlike film. The way it was put together didn't have your normal Aristotelian plot, you know. Uh, it was confusing at first, but if you look closely and you watch it again and again, uh, there's lots of connections you can make that is almost like free association in the dream. What Freud called free association really isn't so free. There's connections, there's, there's symbolic uh, implications that the unconscious makes that consciously you're not even aware of, but there's like meaning there. And I think we're always looking for more meaning in life and more meaning in happenstance. And I think this film kind of deals with some of that uh, rationality of the irrational, in a sense. I don't know, maybe, uh, I'm, I'm thinking, from my point of view, it seems like people aren't looking for a lot of meaning in life a lot of times these days. It well, they like... want to be entertained, of course. And that's the problem with our culture, is they want instant entertainment. I don't know if this is going to turn into a critique of our culture, but I am I have very oh, strong we've opinions. We've critiqued the culture in Kenosha incredibly on this show, believe me. Uh, you know, we don't leave a lot of stones unturned, you know, but we get an equal uh, helping of insults and uh, criticism back our way constantly here on Crimson well, Theater. People have no idea what a horror host show is or have a good time. And, uh, you know, we got to try to raise the standards all the way around uh, with Kenosha. Is that That's why, why you're showing Bucket of Blood? Well, Bucket of Blood isn't so bad. I know you haven't who seen it. Who made that film? Roger Corman made oh, that well, film. Uh, Roger Corman made it, who did a lot of the gothic thrillers with Vincent Price, but this is back in the 50s before that. This takes place in sort of a beatnik cafe, and uh, it's about a guy who's desperately trying to fit in with the uh, artistic society, like, you know, so many kids out there want to be punk rockers now. But he can't make it, just like they can't, and it's just uh, one thing spirals into another, but it's good fun. I think you'd like it, and uh, didn't you... Uh, Did he, does he try to get a gimmick? Oh, well, he's got a gimmick. I think he puts his bodies in plaster and stuff like that, and uh, it's not as bad. We could have got... Oh, there's a British screen. artist right now who's making waves, who is showing not only sliced animals in formaldehyde, but human parts. Yes, I, I've heard about that formaldehyde. one. formaldehyde. Yeah, I don't know what to think about that one. What and, do you think and, about and it? And displayed in such a way that it becomes this almost abstract visual entity that, uh, and yet once you know what it is, it's gruesome, say. But yet he's 
he's making it in the art world. I, I know he's got he's so the guy with the big tanks with the blue. Yes. Yeah. Well, you know what? It's probably not a far cry from tonight's no. movie. Actually, you should see it. You'd be surprised. Oh, and, but it's really it's pretty. Uh, you know, it's pretty much fun. It's not very hardcore. I really don't like the slasher films. I don't know if you knew that or not. Um, I think. You know, as I said a million times on Crimson Theater, the movie Halloween is the absolute worst thing that ever happened to the holiday. It's just a slasher film. I like the old classics, you know. Um, your silent film reminded me a little bit of, like, you know, The Golem and uh, The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, yes, Expressionist these are, films. Um, these are historical films of people really uh, having fun with expressing themselves, but not uh, ignoring the deeper meanings at the same time. By slasher film, you mean guts, gore, okay. you know, uh, you know, psycho, uh, psycho you killers on the loose, well, just like real life, say. real life, you know, All right. that kind of thing, you know, like what goes on in real life, you know, that's that's just terrible, you know, or you know, it's just kind of like you know, you know, when you if you've got a child, you would never tell the child that monsters are real. But born-again Christians say the devil is real all the time to small children, and they're telling them a monster is real. Now, if they explain that as a monster, and they can, uh, you know, really handle that from a psychological point of view to be telling a child such a thing, you know, that's cool. But uh, I think in most cases, you guys are way out of whack, and if you're... Faith. I don't think I'm going to go there. If your faith is challenged by a jack-o'-lantern, you're the one with the problem. Well, then that's, that's a problem. I that's think. obviously yeah. the problem. Well, I got him to agree with me about something. Yeah. I, don't know. I think we stand in agreement. I'm thing. not going to go into religion and Christianity. No, no, I'm not expecting <laughs> you to. And I'm not, I'm not trying to really offend because anybody. Because actually, I do use on. some, you know, Christian stuff. Well, they would think that the doc could not be a yeah, Christian. Yeah. That's how I get insulted because yes. they, they well, come up with the pamphlet. Good. They come up with the pamphlet and say they uh, they're trying to save me. They don't know me well enough to be trying to save me yet. They're already you know passing judgment, and you know there's only one person that's supposed to be able to do that. So that's, that's very good, except when it comes to horror movies, and then that's me. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we've had a great time. So, but you know what? We're gonna have to we're gonna have to show bucket of blood. All right, so I'm, gonna, I'm ready to watch it now. Right? Every, 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 uh, have we uh, missed anything here? Is there any more we could uh, well, talk about? Well, just make it to the Anderson. If you've never been to the Anderson Art Center, it's this great mansion, which I think you got a shot of there in that one part. But uh, it's, uh, it's a fantastic uh, institution of art in Kenosha that's maybe not as well known as it should be. And there's going to be a lot of cool people there on Sunday, uh, maybe even your substitute. Uh, my substitute. I don't know. I'm still, you know. Or maybe your ex. I don't I, know. I, I, well, <laughs> oh, now you've gone too far, buddy. You had to throw that in. Who knows what's going on with that? Uh, X the X. My and, ex. Uh, might tonight's be there. feature, Bucket of Blood. Now I'm, the correlation is there. I finally figured it out. And we've got Bucket of Blood. Even though it smells, smells like a bucket <laughs> of something else. And, uh, well, you're seeing Bucket of Blood on Dr. Destruction's Crimson Theater, where you need a little more uh, acroviolet in your... Uh, um, more purple. More purple! My blood is kind of purplish red. Uh, well, it's a, that would be crimson, wouldn't yes, it? Yes, exactly. Makes sense, doesn't it? <laughs> anyway, ghoulies, you get to the movie, and uh, we'll, we'll come back and chat after. Movies. There you are again. And what did I say, uh, Dennis? How did you like Bucket of Blood? Uh, almost as good as Romero, but not quite. Not quite as good as uh, Night of the Living Dead. Oh, he's throwing it in there already. <laughs> I see. So uh, I like to critique things. I'm pretty critical. And I'd like to say a few words about your painting, actually. I wonder why you're, this hat isn't in there yet. Uh, I'll have to be in the next painting, <laughs> I guess. I don't know. I like this hat better, um, but uh, we'll see. You know, it's changing. I'm trying to, you know, following somebody's footsteps here, you know, and you never know what you're going to step in, in on Crimson Theater. But uh, go ahead, let it rip. <laughs> well, first of all, it's, it's, it's really nice that it's full size, and that's challenging to do for an artist, number one. Uh, and it's impressive because, it, of course, it's pretty dependent on Albright, as you Oh, know, of course. You know, it's, he's, paying, <laughs> he's paying homage to Ivan Albright, who, of course, you could see at the uh, Art Institute. Uh, I think, though, that, of course, this coloration is a little more, you know, maybe adventurous in, in some ways. 
one thing you could still probably learn from him is more glazing, more layering of the paint to create some. I know right, you know, from having Doc in class once in a while, he always goes for the jugular right away with the darks, and he gets dark real fast here. And sometimes it's nice to build your darks more slowly through layering. And that would be one, you know, I like the darks, but they're almost, uh, some of the darks are a little dead, you know? And well, you know, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, We're finding out, though, here in Kirkland. But uh, I think a little more layering in some places, you can look into those deep darks and find even more meaning, but uh, it's, I like the... It is in progress. I like the additional symbols he's adding, and he keeps, it's like a living painting of, that keeps on developing. So I think that is in the spirit, you know, of, uh, of course, uh, Oscar Wilde and so forth. And I, I like that aspect. I think your, your persona might become a little more animated. The eyes are so important in a painting and the little subtle expressions. When I do a portrait, I try to vary them each time, you know. Sometimes I'm kind of scowling or I'm squinting or I'm winking or there's a sly little smile. And, uh, but eyes are pretty important. And one eye here is a little bigger than the other. I don't, maybe. Well, that depends on the morning, you know, what happened the night before. Uh, you never know, I couldn't be there. But there's some very interesting uh, symbolic uh, attributes now, who is this again? Oh, uh, that's from The Vampire's Kiss. Oh. Yeah. Okay, why is that part so small? Ah, uh, that's a good question, but I don't have an answer. It just seemed to fit in there, you know. I was oh. looking for places. Since I started uh, with the premise of the Albright, then I have to kind of... I almost would in. like to see that more integrated, more worked into this. Uh, this is like a chair? Uh, uh, actually, that was sort of a divide, room divider, sort of. Oh, like a screen. Behind the cat, yeah. It might somehow work into the surface better on there. I, was, I think it, it sort of fits into the rhythm, but you almost need to play with the rhythm more. Well, then there's got to be more space for more characters. We probably oh. will never run out of horror flicks, and for every creature to show up somewhere in the painting, we have to reach uh, out that's going to be active, but that's... that's, that's yeah, cool. it might get uh, beyond the Albright. It might I love a lot the of jacket that. and how these uh, images these, uh, are starting to like reveal themselves. Oh, they, they will reveal themselves. That is, you know, as time oh, goes on. Great. I keep it a living painting connected with uh, Crimson Theater. This is probably one of the more down-to-earth, uh, let our hair down episodes, you know. We're kind of just uh, trying to throw it out there for the bullies to get more involved in the fine arts. And, uh, you know, I mean, uh, great classic uh, Godzilla movies and all are great. Great special effects. I like the Godzilla films especially, just because of all the miniature cities and the rubber suits and all the creativity that has to go into making them. That's the, yeah. one of the strong reasons that I like the horror films, is because of so much more creativity has to go into making one of those than a police drama or, uh, you know, one of those midlife crisis movies you'll as see on the As far as the set, you network. mean, the whole setting, the yes. stage set. the mood. And this painting has a great mood, I think, of the stage set, which is, you know, excellent. And I think that uh, just needs to be pushed further and further. I want to see it again in six months. All right. Where you go for it. That's right. Well, I needed some good, uh, solid advice because, you know, you never know in Crimson Theater. All kinds of things are going on here, and usually lots of problems. I mean, we've, we've got a guy that's got a cemetery business in the in the dungeon downstairs, and the bodies are piled up. Oh. I mean, uh, various cast members disappear and then reappear, cause troubles. It's all kinds of problems on Crimson Theater. But we're really glad to have had you. Um, it's, you've been great, and uh, I have to invite you back for one of my dinner party shows if you'd like to come. You can bring a guest. What's on the menu? Uh, that's the, up to whoever's <laughs> cooking that day. Oh. Uh, whether there's an actual dinner, or uh, sometimes the actual dinner will be at my place later, uh, the summer cottage. This painting is making me a little hungry, but uh, hmm. <laughs> Now you opened up a can of worms. <laughs> it must be the coloration down here. Uh, but uh, Fantasia always makes it look like a salad here. Oh, there's a salad on Crimson Theater. Hey, is there going to be salad on the menu? I don't know. What do you like? What's your favorite dish? We'll have it on the menu for the big dinner party, which, by the way, Ghoulies, you can attend if you can find the doctor incognito at the Renaissance Fair. I like uh, soup. I like the entree soup to be very unusual, so I look forward to an unusual 
porridge to start with. And I'm usual porridge! Is that kind of like the gruel from one of those Corman movies? Yeah. Anyway, ghoulies, I hope you enjoyed tonight's show. We'd like to thank Professor Dennis Bayusik one more time for showing up. And be sure to try to check out his exhibit that opens on July 20th at the Anderson Arts Center. Yes. And if you haven't been there yet, you better go check it out. Or, you know, if you're a young ghoulie uh, entering Parkside, I think those art classes, some of them are under uh, Breath of Knowledge. Yes, oh, definitely. My 102 class is a breadth of knowledge, and if you want to get the inside story on my psyche, take, uh, take my 102. Uh, I have quite a dropout rate, but the people who stay there are pretty good. <laughs> I remember that one ago, really. Well, she, did she ever drop out, or did she just uh, intensify the entire She uh, actually uh, dropped out. Yeah. yeah, there's a few, in, you know, it's, it's, you know. There is a few. You can literally hear the Conte claims breaking from the tension <laughs> during the class. But if you ghoulies got, you know, you, they ought to give it a try, come out and meet Dennis. I have mellowed a lot in recent years. Uh, so they've said. <laughs> I think we got to get the old, uh, the old uh, dictator back again, uh, the old dictator Dennis. Uh, I think you went easy on me here and, uh, you know. I've turned into Professor Purple. Professor Purple, you know, we had a problem with the other professor we had uh, in connection with uh, this show. But uh, you'll be the new professor for a while. Professor Purple will return. Professor Purple will return. And that's right, Ghoulies. That's all we've got time for. I hope you enjoyed tonight's features. And, uh, you know, it wasn't your average Crimson Theater program. And that's the way we're going to try to keep it. So you have a whole fine week. And we'll see you next time on Dr. Destruction's Crimson Theater, where we're going to raise the level of uh, things around here, I think. Mm -hmm.